I watched many people over 80, including my dad, who felt they were old and dying and just sat and did nothing till they did. And that frightens me, and I don't want to do that. Uh, <coughs> oh, is that right? Ah, just a minute. I've got to get my Scottish accent right. Perfect. I belong to Glasgow, dear old Glasgow. Now and you'll have to start again because I'm in the wrong key. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Jeff's daughters to this celebration of his life at the wonderful County Hall. We're very grateful for all the help and generosity we've received from the team here in making this evening possible. This building meant an awful lot to Jeff over the 30 years he worked here, and he meant a lot to everyone here. Thank you too for that brilliant fanfare written, especially for this evening, by Jeff's friend Roger Harvey, and played by Anne, Simon and Tom, friends of Jeff players from the LPO. Included in it were some nods to the music that Jeff enjoyed and a repeating rhythm which may or may not have echoed one of the more colourful words that he liked to use. I'm Andrew, I'm partner of Jeff's daughter Claire and I knew Jeff for over 50 years, since I was about seven years old actually. As many of you will already know, Jeff was husband to the wonderful Meg who shared many of his joys and passions, if perhaps not the train spotting. He was father to Cass, Claire, Rach and Shelley, adored grandfather of his and Meg's eight grandchildren, as well as big brother and uncle. 
He was a great friend to many, a talented architect, first-class train spotter, a lifelong Coventry City supporter, patron of the arts, and always an inimitable entertainer. From all the warm words his daughters have heard said of him over the last four months, it's wonderful for them to know that he was loved and respected by so many. Some of the words they most often heard said about Jeff were kind, generous, loyal, fun, unconventional, unique, and always great company. And now some of the friends from Jeff's different walks of life will share their memories of him with us. everyone gets Nick Thompson as a warm-up man. Uh, looking at who's here today, I may have the right speech, but the wrong audience. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a celebration in honour of one of the industry's most memorable, eclectic, infuriating and lovable characters. You can choose your own preferred description from a long list, because everybody has their very own version of Jeff. Given the brevity of today's occasion, my version of Jeff has been ever so slightly sanitised. But don't worry, it has neither been edited nor exaggerated. To try and embellish anything about the man would be completely pointless. His life was surely stranger than any fiction we could write. It is as a friend and colleague, pupil and partner, with over 25 years of exposure, that allows me to take you on a couple of stops on the train journey that was sharing life with Jeff. Remembering Jeff is remembering someone who was absolutely at ease in his own skin. He was an alternative lifestyle, or a comic strip from Viz. Just think, the wardrobe, the sky blue roller, the London bus, the train set, the railway station at Sawtree. In fact, Jeff was a Viz summer special all on his own. He found time to invent a whole new language. Words and their true meaning were of no consequence to the man. Who knew the simple nouns like syphilis and bristles had so many applications? <laughs> and not content with his gift of words, he also taught us an international sign language. <laughs> Enough. It's time to get serious. Maybe. He was a constant supporter of our efforts and as a recipient of one of his ultimate accolades, you're a fucking genius, mate, for a short time I felt like the chosen one. Well, that joy was short-lived, as five minutes later, the bloke who changed his light bulb was also referred to as a fucking genius. He set an example to us all. Arriving at the office each morning early, he would rummage in his man bag, careful not to build up too much static and self-combust due to his Part B non-compliant shell suit, and hand over to Bex and then to Andrea his fully filled dictaphone, filled with his late-night administrative input so forcing them to spend the next few hours listening to Jeff drone on and on whilst he typed up thousands of train numbers or bus numbers or plane numbers. He was able to listen patiently for lengthy periods hearing aggressive contractors lay blame at the architect's door for poor or late design. He could see through the emotion and the anger and quietly calm, diffuse and slow the situation down with carefully considered and detailed responses such as, that's bollocks mate and you know it. <laughs> Enough. I could go on and on, a bit like Jeff, I suppose, but I won't. How will I and others, I hope others, remember him? Simply with a great deal of affection. He was, importantly, many things to many people. And to be his friend was a gift that he kept on giving. I doubt even Nick Thompson would have a bad word to say about him. Because he was, essentially, a very warm and generous human being. Generous with his time, his assistance, his encouragement his patience and his belief in his workmates. He was supportive to all his team and he gave us all an opportunity to push ourselves perhaps further than we might have thought at at the time. He was funny and when it mattered, he could be serious. When it mattered, he could be very serious. He was a friend and he was unique, which made knowing and working alongside him so memorable. But really, and most importantly, he was a loving husband, he was a doting father, and later on, the epitome of an avuncular grandfather. And in the end, that was all he really cared about. His trains, his books, his books of numbers, his chosen profession, his football clubs, his railway station, that 240 feet of hand-laid railway track, 
were simply an adjunct to the life, his life as a great friend of us all, Jeff Mann. Well, this is the perfect place for Jeff, isn't it? As just been said, this was his heart of his working life. And um, his great joy, as he often talked about, was Coventry. And he got so excited when they got to the final of the Cup, FA Cup. And he said to me, I'm going to go and have a suit made for this event. He, asked his secretary, would you, would you mind going and um, find me a tailor in, in uh, a really smart London tailor. So, and tell him I'll bring my own material. So off he goes to Savile Row and meets this frightfully severe sort of gentleman. And uh, Jeff shows him his Coventry terraline striped material. And, and they said, oh, well, well, of course, I mean, I know you may want that as a lining, but how about that? No, 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 said Jeff. I want this to be the outside of my suit. So he got measured for this suit in this brilliant material with a certain amount of concern by, by this uh, tailor. And it came to the point that uh, Jeff came for his final fitting and he said, but how about the waistcoat? Well, you didn't, uh, well, I want a waistcoat. How about the stripes going horizontal on the waistcoat? I don't think we'd want Sir to look silly, would we? <laughs> and that, that sort of set Jeff up, I think. I think that was the moment he decided his future was to be a little bit silly. And so this suit went the rounds, and he would... As you know, Jeff was very much involved with all sorts of high-power developers and big civic lunches and the rest of it, city lunches. And he always wore his suit. But on top of that, he then had paper caps for the Coventry City supporters. And he made all these high-power developers wear these caps throughout the meeting. And, and that was so typically Jeff. Um, I feel that that moment of being saying we don't want Sir to look silly was a sort of a, a Damascus moment for Jeff. And from that moment on, he seemed to develop this wonderful approach of everything was being slightly silly. And it's very sad because he brought a fresh meaning to silly. Silly is sort of the th sort of things that uh, are a bit odd and bit laugh but I said to my granddaughters when you grow up the most important thing in life is sometimes to be silly be silly because it actually lightens the mood and changes people's feelings about what's going on so Jeff was one of the great examples of silly in in the glorious tradition of sort of English farce on television and radio um, I know you all remember those programs. We've rather lost them now. But I think he invented or redefined silliness. And that, to me, made him a terrific partner and companion. Well done, Jeff. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Jeff Mann, our Jeff. Jeff Mann was a deeply talented, highly intelligent, thoughtful, sensitive and caring man. Jeff was also a man who created a persona who reveled in the gift of surprise. Colourful language, extreme prose, Jeff had a special talent. No, it wasn't Tourette's, 
It was vivid eloquence. Our relationship was forged through football and train travel, and on the train you have time to talk and reflect. I have jotted down a few notes recalling my train journey reflections, and I'd like to share these with you. Sunderland reflection, Jeff the barman. Jeff taking control of the bar and becoming the barman. I have a photo of Jeff smiling, cheekily serving boardroom guests with gin and very little tonic. Hartlepool reflections, Jeff the entertainer. Extended pub crawl. He was, after all, only nearly 80 at this point. Jeff, I'm convinced, had arithmomania, which is a real word, compulsive obsession for numbers. Trains, planes, buses, bus spotting, another set of numbers to collect. I set the scene, Harrow bus station. After a black tie dinner in Harrow with Meg, he'd asked the taxi to stop at Harrow bus depot. He was missing a small but seemingly meaningful set of bus numbers. Meg, the ever patient, sat in the car and waited. Jeff, stealthily, like a cat, carefully disappeared into the depot. Whereby, Jeff's words, this huge West Indian security guard caught Jeff sneaking around. What are you doing, man? How do you know my name? said Jeff, and quick as a flash, <laughs> he slipped out of the back. Beyond Sawtree, beyond the club boardroom, train marketing yards, bus depots, Jeff also had a rich, cultured tapestry of interests. Jeff the artist, drawing, music, playing the piano, and encouraging others to play instruments. He had a deep respect for classical musicians and their music. He got a love for the LPO, the festival hall, and, he also, and of course he shared this with his beloved Meg. Jeff the creative genius, architecture. Jeff was very fond of both Maxan and County Hall. I have been blessed to have got to know Jeff Mann extremely well. Whether it's through timeless train journeys or driving him to games, we spoke of many subjects, but principally football and fond memories of Meg. Jeff was an extraordinary character creative genius who on the one hand was a kind gentle soulful warm-hearted man but of course he remained the inimitable cheeky chappy moreover jeff was our dear friend play up sky blues play up our jeff thank you And now, our last but not least speaker of the evening, uh, one of Jeff's oldest friends, Mike Franks. Two days before Jeff died, I wrote him a letter, not knowing the full extent of his condition. The girls told me he was lying down, mostly with his eyes shut, half asleep, but they read it to him, and he smiled. This is part of it. Jeffrey Mann, you glorious control freak. I've always admired you, or at least most of the time. You and Meg have been part of mine and Penny's life for over 60 years, and I've enjoyed and appreciated it. Rude bugger you may have been, but you're our rude bugger. Now it seems you're going, and I find myself powerfully sad. I don't want to speak for anybody else except to them. I have my own strong memories of football, St. Cath's, that daft bus, and of course, laying track in Sawtree. 
perhaps Meg didn't didn't try to contain the rest of us in the way that she kept a steadying hand on you. But I remember the generosity and the humour of all those years back. And even if it took us 50, 25 years to build that, your, ro your mad project, it was worth it. Enough. I'll miss you, mate. Big time. In so many ways, I'm sorry that some of this will not sequence properly, because there were see as I wrote them, I started to f see bigger things somehow, the paradigm shift of the 60s and things like that. We were all part of it, and this was Jeffrey in the middle of it, and Meg, because Meg was at school of art, not at school of art, she did geography, I think, and Meg and Jeff were an item, even in 1960. And us new boys only knew Jeff and Dave and Joe, Joe Turner, from their drawings at the end of the year. The, the drawings were put up for, for the crit, what were called the crit, at the end of the year. And we'd all go down to the basement and look. And one of the lecturers, Quentin Hughes, would take the best drawings. And so when we got there, half the bloody drawings had gone from people. I lost piles of my drawings. And I never saw them again. I don't know if Jeff did or anybody else. But we went and saw these, and they were wonderful. They were presentations on hardboard, painted white, with the drawings from a drawing board and pencil and other things. You know, talk about CAD CAM, it didn't come near the drawings that were done. Jeff was also the manager of the school football team. And even when Meg was by his side, Dampening down his worst successes. I remember coach trips over the Pennines to play against different tribes. And on the return, we often stopped at pubs, pistols, like, <laughs> pistols, <laughs> well, we got this. But Meg made sure that it was done properly. I love Meg. She was special. Meg went too early. And, but she had such a contrast, and she was such a contrast to Jeff. But they were a brilliant couple. And they made the station house at Sawtree into such a welcoming place for so many different people. And we spent 25 years laying tracks there. When he was a taskmaster as well. Jeff, the certifiable train spotter, kept the most incredible records that were almost frightening to look at for the degree of order and control that they revealed, that on re but on reflection, I can see that the discipline in some of his early buildings, I can see that in the discipline of his early buildings, and his ruthless clear-headedness did not stop him from being a good friend and enjoyable company, and a glorious, <laughs> Jester, always assuming you could stand there and smile at his extraordinary cruel humour. You'd just say it in front of you. You'd be cringing. People there would be so surprised. Sorry, I'm losing my point. Uh, even Meg could not contain this. Although I didn't do a lot, I don't think he did that much of it in front of me. I think quite a lot of it was out of her sight. She knew that it was out of her sight. Otherwise, he'd be in detention, wouldn't he? I showed him a few times. I know each other. The thing about it, I realise, I think Jeff was a shy man. I really do. And I think he invented this system for putting people off guard. He would put you off balance from the start. But he really was quietly shy. And that was his technique. He was the clever boy. Jeffrey was the rudest and most talented person I ever met. It was my privilege to know him. 
and I'll never forget it. Thanks, Mike. And now to round off this part of the evening, we'll hear from uh, Jeff's friend and duet partner, Emma Aritza. Good evening, everyone. Well, I think I'm going to let the music speak. I had the privilege and immense pleasure to be playing with Jeff in quite a few performances, and I, I truly believe that when you play with someone, that partnership, it's, it's something really quite unique and special. So I think I really had an, a special bond with, with Jeff, so this is for him. speakers and musicians for this evening and um, invite you outside for some drinks and some canapes. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. <laughs>